You all ready to join me today in our trip to outer space? Yeah. Albert Shivers. The Matrix doesn't happen. That's very true. Come along quietly or not. Night. Goodbye, please. As I was about the time to ride. From Albert Shivers. The mistress of the fading light. They don't have to like it. They're trying to put a caravan. The general concept is that creativity flourishes in an in a atmosphere of freedom. Have you ever thought of... Um, Changing your music. No. Changing your Why should you change music? Some Mozart people. didn't change. Bach didn't change. Some people call it progressive, Louis. Well, what is progressive? You tell me, because all we play is good music. We never did worry about styles. There ain't no such thing as styles in music. There ain't but two kinds, good or bad. That's all. Now, that progressive and all that jujitsu music, all that, you can have it. I'm not interested, because I get my applause for playing good. In any language, a note's a note. Do you think then that some of these um, people that play today uh, spend too much time in worrying about fantastic pieces to play and forget the simplicity? I'm not interested. If I buy a record, it suits my taste, it's got the beat and the tone and what I like, that's all. I ain't worried about the fellas, they ain't what they ain't doing. That ain't my position. Uh, I got a lot of my personal worries. So I go by my ear, what I hear. That's why I buy records. Hello, folks, and welcome to another last-minute episode of the Planet Shivers podcast. I decided to throw this together yesterday, soon as I would realized that today is Louis Armstrong's birthday. Actually, I thought about it earlier in the week, and then more yesterday, and decided to nail this down today. So we heard a little bit of an excerpt from a Louis Armstrong interview just before, and that was right from the private collection of probably one of the biggest Louis Armstrong dorks there is. Um, Ricky Riccardi is the guy's name, and he is amazing. If you want to know anything about Armstrong, he's the guy, and he's not, to me, one of these boring biographers with the pencil protector and that whole bit that could be telling you about your favorite topic on the planet and they make you want to fall over asleep. Ricky is not like that. Um, This is the interview that is from England, 1968. Um, Louis Armstrong talking about music, talking about other musicians, how they play, uh, and he reminisces about King Oliver. You got the little first little taste of it. I'm going to tack the rest of it on to the end of this interview or this conversation with me. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just reading here to see what if there was anything else about this recording. But that's all there is to know about it. But it's a good one. Other than that, I think I want to just tell you a little bit of what I think of Lewis and a little story about him and also recommend you a couple of pieces of music by him as well. So, first of all, me personally, I've studied a lot of jazz, I've read all the books, I've watched nearly all the documentaries and all that crap and to me, Laying it all out, Louis Armstrong is probably the most important creator in music, definitely jazz. But you have to remember that jazz has so many different offshoots, and Louis Armstrong was right at the roots of it. Um, He was born today in 1904. Started out in New Orleans as a boy, learned under King Oliver, who was the big hot jazz musician at the time when the genre of music was just starting out. King Oliver was the peak at that time, and here comes Louis Armstrong. Um, later on, you'll hear Armstrong tell some stories about King Oliver and how Oliver was the only 
jazz musician of the time who would take the time out to tutor the young kids when all the other adult musicians just didn't have time, went to go drink and went to the brothel. Um, King Oliver would set aside time to teach the kids and Lewis always appreciated that. And that stuck with him even as late as this interview from the 60s. And that was really, you know, you don't, you don't hear a lot about Louis Armstrong's early career unless you're really interested or wrapped up in the old jazz music and or Louis Armstrong. Um, so most people, the average person, if they know who Louis Armstrong is, they'll know what a wonderful world and associate that with him or they'll know what a wonderful world and they'll know who he is but maybe they don't remember his name or anything like that as I got deeper into Armstrong's career and learning about him and reading about him I began to resent what a wonderful world because here's a guy with decades and decades and decades of creative original work and amazing music, great music. Music that makes you feel something inside, makes you happy, makes you feel good. And what, like, what more can you ask of somebody else's art form that it, just, it simply just makes you feel good? But anyway... I resented What a Wonderful World. And I knew there was this giant catalog of amazing music that everybody was ignoring because they were stupid. That was what was going through my head at the time. These dumbasses only know this little splinter in the oak. <laughs> That's Louis Armstrong. I, I even can remember when I worked at the Main Street jukebox in Stroudsburg, an old lady came in and was looking for Louis Armstrong cause she, and I pointed her, because I'm an idiot at the time. So I point her directly to the old Louis Armstrong stuff. All that 20s and 30s, heebie-jeebies, West End Blues, because... In my head, I'm like, this is what you should be listening to. And she looks through them and says, oh, I wanted a CD with It's a Wonderful World on it. And then I just threw a one, because there's there those are a dime a dozen. So she got one of those. And I remember being really annoyed by it. But all that changed on New Year's of 2000. 17 into 18 which was a big big time for me a um, lot of stuff going on in those years so I'm at my father's house for New Year's yeah it was definitely 17 into 18 it had to be or 16 to 17 somewhere in there and I'm at my father's they're watching the ball drop in New York and the ball drops, boom, New Year. They sing the New Year's song that they always sing. And then directly after that is Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful World. And I hear those those opening notes and the, the orchestra playing. And in the first second, the first few seconds, I just roll my eyes. Oh, geez. And, and that... The, the same annoyance of the old lady at the record store or the, all that annoyance that really snobby is what it is. This snobby annoyance of being irritated that the world, humans now, <laughs> only know Louis Armstrong by this one song. All that was bubbling up. And I remember the camera panning across the city down to the people and all the thousands of people that have been standing out there all day peeing in diapers 
they were all singing along with Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful World. And then all that irritation just poof, it just disappeared in me because I realized that he's still there. He's still out there. And does it matter that maybe to a real jazz snob's perspective, they are only seeing this one little nugget of his, it's all now and accumulated to just what a wonderful world. And this man who invented and created music that makes you feel good is only now just this schmaltzy tune that is, you hear more parodies of it than you do the original sometimes. But if that's all that's really left in people's minds, Louis Armstrong still survives and still lives, even though it's just that dumb song. So not only did I learn to appreciate the song a little bit more for that reason, but it like shook me, this idea that, okay, there's this one song, but this guy, born in 1904, August 4th, who was just born poor and just created music with, I explained it this way, about his version of... Um, Dark Eyes, where it's he played his music with unbridled freedom. It was the the peak of of art of artistic expression. Any artist, be it visual, musician, um, acting, any artist, anybody who considers them an artist, that's the goal. But I listened to this particular song by Louis Armstrong there's other ones you just hear this freedom in it and that's how it's so good because all the fronts are down you you are creating in the moment and that's jazz so I ended up having to leave the living room and sit by myself for a little while because it was it was just a big thing for me to kind of defeat this little personal battle and there's dumb reason to be angry at you I'm not a jazz snob I, or I don't want to be this guys suck you know me too oh uh, yeah a little coffee wait a minute So, let me move on to the album recommendations. And, like I said, I'm not... If I'm recommending an album to you, or a song, listen to it. Because I'm very discerning. I'm not going to recommend you garbage. If you don't like it, and it's not your thing, that's something different. But no, when I'm recommending something... Be it movies or music on this show from before up to now and after. Um, I think a lot about it. Because if I think about this. <laughs> if you've ever had somebody give you a movie or a CD that you hated. It just was bad. Not even that. There's so you could not like something and still appreciate it. I'm not gonna name any names. There's plenty of popular music all through the years that I don't like. Don't wouldn't listen to it on my own. Wouldn't seek it out on my own. Big names, huge. But 
I can appreciate it from a distance. I know why it's important. I know why it's a big deal. I know the reason for it, but it's just not my bag. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when somebody recommends something or gets you borrow an, a record or a or a, a DVD and you get it and you watch it or you listen to it and you think, holy crow, this is god awful. Who would even watch this? You can't tell me that you're leery of their recommendations in the future. They got to strike against them. Where on the other hand, oh man, Dave, oh man, Dave knows his movies. If Dave ever lets you borrow a movie, you know it's going to be good. Or, man, Wendy's got great records. When Wendy recommends a record, you listen to it because she, and she's got good taste. But Ralph, phew, Ralph has no taste. If he recommends something, uh, you could let it, might be a waste of your time. I don't know. Stick with Dave and Wendy. So these recommendations come with a lot of thought behind them. So what I I would tell you to go back, listen to the old 1920s Louis Armstrong stuff, the Hot Fives, the Hot Sevens, West End Blues, all the 1930s stuff when he went to Chicago and he w went to New York and recorded a lot of his most popular tunes at the time. But I want to focus on later Louis. Louis later on, where doesn't get a lot of attention. You think about What a Wonderful World, and you think about Hello, Dolly, which was the last jazz tune to reach number one on the pop charts, beating out the Beatles. So that's like double victory for old Louis Armstrong. But he, he was still real real in jazz he that was what a wonderful world hello dolly they were extras they were crowd pleasers in a way they pleased him but they were crowd pleasers as well there's and there's nothing wrong with a crowd pleaser a couple of them but when you really want to dig into it he was aggressively jazz in his later years if you see any of the videos on youtube of louis armstrong and his all-star band sometimes he had jack teagarden in there old tr trombonist um those bands were tight and yes he was he was holding on to his roots and he, he kept that new orleans style of music but he also to me and <coughs> maybe i'm projecting this this is what I want it to be, or this is how I feel about it. But that Louis Armstrong and his All Star, certain tunes like Jerry, or um, certain things that he recorded that we're going to talk about, they were played with a little bit of a middle finger underneath of it. This little bit of like, yeah, we're playing New Orleans old New Orleans jazz. Fuck you, we're sticking with it. Oh, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I pick up a little bit of attitude in some of Armstrong's playing. So let's get to it. Um, the first one, I got two albums here. The first one is going to be The Great Summit, which came out originally, I believe, okay, it was recorded in 1961, probably came out a year or two later. 63, for some reason, is in my head. But The Great Summit is an album that where Louis Armstrong got together with Duke Ellington, who is probably a very, is probably, he is to me, uh, a hair close in second place to Louis Armstrong for the most important men in jazz. Most important people in jazz. Just... They're important, all right? Um, getting caught up in semantics. 
I wouldn't be surprised if you heard songs from this record. Most importantly, you probably heard um, Drop Me Off in Harlem. That was also the credits music and maybe even the intro music to Harlem Nights with Richard Pryor, uh, Red Fox, and Eddie Murphy, and Della Reese, and a very young Charlie Murphy, Danny Aiello. Um, the girl from A Different World, Jasmine something? Jasmine Guy, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Hall Nights, that's, that's a good movie. But yeah, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong, and like I said, Louis Armstrong's playing has this attitude to it. And if you wanted to reduce it down to some choice tracks, <laughs> some nuggets off of this uh, album here, I would say The Mooch, I would say Black and Tan Fantasy. And I would say In a Mellow Tone. And I would say Don't Get Around Much Anymore. And, and, um, where, it's on here, ain't it? Yeah, Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing. You've all heard that. Listen to this version of it, because it's pretty damn good, too. Also, right around this time, Armstrong, his band, and Duke Ellington showed up to play two songs on Ed Sullivan show. Um, they played Duke's Place and they played in a mellow tone. And whenever I watch it, I mean, they're great, but I also imagine other musicians of the time, jazz musicians, sitting around the TV watching two masters and maybe some of them may have had a chip on their shoulder a lot of the current 1950s and 60s guys late 40s guys had a little bit of a chip on their shoulder with louis because of his mugging and because of his just very soft polite demeanor but he he stuck up for himself and for people when he needed to and you could find a lot of stories like that online as well Civil War Day is all that stuff. The second album that I want to recommend is another later album. I think it's not... I believe this one came out before the Louis, the Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington one. This is... Louis Armstrong plays W.C. Handy. Now, W.C. Handy wrote a lot of songs that went on to be very popular, such as St. Louis Blues... Yellow Dog Blues, a lot of blues. And he also had a movie made about him that is a lot of fun and has Nat King Cole and Eartha Kitt. Nat King Cole plays W.C. Handy in the movie and does a great job. The movie used to be on YouTube. I'm not sure if... Uh, lights in the, I'm not sure if it's still there, but it probably is. So check that out. And that movie is called St. Louis Blues. And... The version of St. Louis Blues on this particular record is my favorite of any version of St. Louis Blues. Duke Ellington's is really good. There's earlier versions of Armstrong doing it that are real good. And of course, Bessie Smith, she does a good one. She was one of the pioneers of that song. She might have been the first person to sing it. I just don't want to talk out of school. I'm pretty sure she was, but I don't want to be throwing facts around if I'm not 100% on all this stuff. Um, but yes, if you look up Louis Armstrong plays W.C. Handy and listen to St. Louis Blues, even just the beginning of it, the rolling horns and the pounding drums, very good, very good version of it. And that's really about it. I just wanted to get on the mic and talk about Louis Armstrong today. So that's what we did here. Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing me ramble on about it. And um, go, if you want to learn more about Louis Armstrong, the, the direction I'm going to point you is all, you know, all the obvious ones, documentaries, read about him. But I also 
strongly want to point you in the direction of Ricky Riccardi. Um, he is one of the most enthusiastic jazz biographers and Louis Armstrong biographers I've ever seen. He just loves the music and it pours out of him. It pours out of him. He is the author of What a Wonderful World, The Magic of Louis Armstrong's Later Years. And he also has another book out there. You could see his blog. Go check it out. Read it. See what he's doing at www.dippermouth that's d i p p e r m o u t h dot blog spot b l o g s p o t dot com that is ricky riccardi's blog you could also follow him on instagram He's very involved with the Louis Armstrong House and the Louis Armstrong Museum. Um, I have yet to go there, but a, a little bit of a personal dream of mine would not only be able to go there, um, I'd like to visit Louis Armstrong's grave. I've never done that. That would mean a lot to me. And I don't even know if they do it or not. I have yet to find the time, and I guess it's shame on me, but I have yet to find the time to find out if I can do this, if I can make this happen, but I'd love to have my most recent painting of Louis Armstrong titled Artist on Earth hanging in some way, shape, or form in the Louis Armstrong house. Man, that would really mean a lot to me to be able to do that. But on that note, I'm going to give this podcast back over to Louie and for myself and for all you guys listening, a happy birthday to him wherever he is. But if anybody is really truly living through their music to this day, I think it's it's Louis Armstrong. And I also want to dedicate this episode to all, all of my jazz loving friends who have gone on jazz tirades, jazz rants, and jazz conversations with me. Um, I, I specifically want to name a lot of people, but three in particular, but all my friends over in Cresco and Everybody, all the, all the inner circle, you know who you are. For all the jazz rants they've had to sit through. For Isaac, who has probably sat through the most jazz rants. And he's my buddy on this podcast. And also for the great jazz conversations that I've had with David Saxman and Karin and our shared love of Armstrong because he's really important. He he is a bit of a caricature of himself. Maybe that's... I don't know if I'm explaining that exactly right. But you, you know what I mean. There's that part of it. But that is just a little... Like I said before, it's the splinter. It's the, 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 the toothpick in a giant oak tree. That's, that's it. So listen to some Armstrong. And listen, if you, if you don't like the first thing you hear, keep digging. The first song, maybe you never listen to old jazz. Maybe you never listen to Louis Armstrong. You may not love the first song you hear, but keep digging around. Uh, you will find something that you enjoy, whether it makes you smile, whether it makes you feel something, whether it brings you down or picks you up. But I bet you you can find an Armstrong song that just makes you feel good like it does me. That's all I got. Thank you all for listening to this episode. 
And like I say in every other episode, take care of yourself and take care of somebody else. We're on all major podcast platforms as well as Spotify and YouTube. And that's it. Happy birthday, Louis Armstrong. You are listening to the first station on your dot. WCNW operating on a frequency of 1,500 kilocycles in Brooklyn, New York. So one more quick thing. In the upcoming Armstrong interview clip, you're going to hear Louis Armstrong reference to a young child. According to Ricky Riccardi, he is referencing a seven-year-old boy who he had just heard play the trumpet earlier that day. The boy, his name turns out to be Enrico Tommaso, who went on to be a big trumpeter in England. Just want to fill you guys in on that. Enjoy. So I don't care what the other fella's doing. I ain't got time. Why should I? Anyway, I'm not booking them. But is there any particular music that you like? All music. I like all music that's good. I played in a symphony orchestra in 1925 for silent pictures. And we played everything you hear these big orchestras playing. Right there on, in, in the Vendome Theater in Chicago. And we changed programs twice a week with movies. And we play an overture. Then we go into the jazz. Quite nice, that's how I got in there. But still, in all look at the experience I had by being there. Waiting for myself to come in with the jazz chorus or whatever it is. But we play overture first. And there's the experience right there. William Tell was nothing after I was there two weeks. Understand? Because I was interested in my horn and everything went with it. And, uh, and it wasn't much different, the divisions of the, the measures and all that that we did in the funeral marches. Three, four time, four, four time, 12, eight time, the same. So everything's been done before, nothing new. But I listen to the best of music, which is just plain music. But you got to stand on your head and all that, but that's their business. But do you think that the, that the people that played in your early day played from the heart rather, from the, rather than from the mind? I don't know what they did. I don't know where they blew it from. They, they could have took some beans that night, and you can tell where they blew it from. They all have been 40 years old, who knows? That's their business. But if it sounded good, I don't care where it came from. You understand? Yeah. Music is music. That's all I go by. I'm not such a technician. And that's the worst thing, put that on. The worst thing, the public, and especially musicians, they ruin music. Musicians trying to play for them. So they can say, man, you out of this world. And they ain't even paid for to get in the damn concert at all. If you'd have gone and pleased them people that appreciate it like wonderful world, that's just a tame uh, tune to your hip, uh, if you're called a hip musician. And they ask them to play it, you know, you have the tone to play it. But still in all, if you don't blow your brains out, that's what ruined a lot of musicians through the years. And ruin music. Trying to please the other musician that he can't play nothing himself. A very profound statement. You bet your life. I like to lost my lip trying to please these cats standing there with their arms full. Mm -hmm. What? What can you play? So I cut it out so you get results. And that's what I want. People that dig what's supposed to. You're, you're supposed to sing, you're supposed to relax, you're supposed to play. And, uh, and them cats, uh, when I looked around, I said, they're they BSing. So I cut out from them. That's why you have a whole lot of juju, some music and all that stuff. Now it's played out. They say, what is it about the progressive jazz, the music of tomorrow? I said, we didn't go through all that. As long as it sounded good, from Buddy Boland's time up to now, King Oliver, everything he played, you hear it now in five-part brass and things. Dig that, else they wouldn't have had nothing to, to survive on. Don't be for King Oliver. Leave that. It goes all over the world. Every time they make a riff, it's Joe Oliver. 
creator. How many trumpet players coming up today is a creator? Tell me. Name one. There's 10 billion trumpet players. Name one that you think is a creator. You got me there. And if you name one, I'll kiss your pocketbook. <laughs> Is there any particular Oliver that you like and have always liked? Who? Any particular King Oliver that you've always liked? Everything he did. When I ate red beans and rice with him at his house, and uh, he had a big tin bucket full of sweetened water, just sugar and water. He didn't want coffee and all that. Just a big bucket of sweetened water to rinse them beans down. His wife, Miss Oliver, made me a little bucket too, like the three little bears. I had my little bucket too. Because Joe Oliver, whatever he did, I want to do. All that was music. He never told me yet. He catched me on the street. All them cats too busy to, to uh, I'm around 17 years old. Uh, uh, with my lesson, I run it to him. The rest of the cats, they go into the Eagle Saloon. I ain't got time, boy. But Joe Oliver stops and no, you're dividing that wrong. Before you go into the saloon and have his drink. So you got to love him. They was too great. So like this little kid, yeah. They was too great. Oh, he's just a little shaver, so what? But to me, the notes that came out of that horn, so beautiful, I know a million trumpet players would give anything in the world to sound like this kid sounded today in that airport. And that's what I listened to. The notes come out of his horn. Every note he hit meant something. The tone's always been important to you, Louis. The notes, too. It's got to come from his mind and his heart to make the notes that little boy played. And the average cat, he ain't thinking about how much I'm going to get for the gig tonight. He ain't got time to think of that. This boy ain't worried about nothing but the beauty. This thing, if he start playing and keep playing till he's about 17 years old, there you go. Nobody touch him. And all he got to do is blow out an arrow. He didn't know it himself. You don't have to kill yourself to play good. Wow.